Basra the thumbs up signal from them. We're looking again at a bridge by way of video phone, an Iraqi bridge over a canal that is near the Tigris River, that is near the city of Basra. We believe it could be to the southeast, maybe to the east, not quite sure exactly the location. Uh, but this is where Marty Savage is embedded with the U.S. Marines. We do anticipate this bridge that is heavily damaged, we're told, uh, to be blown up at some time, uh, possibly very soon. So we'll keep an eye on that. As we do, though, there is serious political discussions underway very soon in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Uh, British Prime Minister Tony Blair, U.S. President uh, George Bush, flying there today to talk about Iraq, the Middle East peace process, and peace for Northern Ireland. Suzanne Malvo, ahead of the team there in Belfast, joins us live to talk about all of these big three pieces of the pie. Suzanne, hello. Hi, Bill. It is really a very ambitious agenda that the two leaders are going to take on, but uh, we have been told, yes, those three items. Uh, President Bush uh, left early from the White House. will be arriving in Belfast later this afternoon. This is the third time the two leaders uh, have met in as many weeks. And top of the agenda, of course, is a post-Saddam regime. We know that uh, France, Germany, and Russia really want to see a predominant role of the UN to play in that regime. But the United States, the Bush administration, has made it very clear over the last week or so that they see that they will be in charge, the Allied forces. They are looking at a limited role for the UN. Now, where Mr. Blair stands is somewhere in the middle. That is where the delicate negotiations will take place in their discussions. One of the main challenges really here is whether or not they can come up with a UN resolution that the UN Security Council will pass that really gives a sense of legitimacy to a new Iraqi government, this interim Iraqi authority. The other issue that they're facing as well is, the, is one of timing. When do they bring this about? When is it important to get those people on the ground? There's somewhat of a disagreement within the administration itself. The Pentagon looking to move sooner as opposed to late, later, saying that really they want to put an Iraqi face on this, but the State Department taking a bit more of a, a measured look at this, a measured tone. But as you know, Bill, a lot on their plate. We'll see what they come up with. The two leaders are going to meet for dinner this evening and then private discussions tomorrow. Bill? All right, Suzanne, let's, let's talk about Middle East peace, a topic that's been pushed to the background because of the war in Iraq right now. What is the proposal that seems to be emerging right now in terms of a roadmap there? Well, absolutely, Bill. It's a very important point, and Mr. Blair has really been pushing the Bush administration to be more aggressive in asserting itself, its commitment to the Middle East peace, the roadmap that they like to call it, uh, they are waiting essentially for the Palestinian leadership, the, the Prime Minister, to really get their components, their elements of their government together before they move forward. But Mr. Blair really sees this as a credibility issue because at the same time they want to get garner the type of support from Arab nations. They feel they will not be able to do so when it comes to building Iraq unless they deal even-handedly with the Middle East peace crisis. That is one of the reasons that that is coming up in this meeting and one of the reasons it came up uh, just a week ago at Camp David. So. Suzanne, thank you. Suzanne Mavo again reporting on the ground there in Belfast. As Suzanne mentioned, later tonight, uh, the two leaders will hold a dinner and a lot to talk about there. Let's talk more about it from London right now. Jamie Rubin's back with us, former Assistant Secretary of State, uh, back with us here on CNN. Jamie, good to have you back and welcome. I uh, want to know, thank first you, of Bill. all, uh, what's the sense you're getting in London regarding Tony Blair and uh, U.S. President George Bush? Do they feel a sense of vindication based on the amount of criticism they were taking only 10 days or two weeks ago and now looking at this conflict, uh, not near an end, but quite close to it possibly, and not only three weeks old. Well, absolutely. I think you, have in dis you need to distinguish here between the military and the political side. On the military side, I uh, really believe that the Blair government is beginning to feel vindicated. You can tell the way they're talking, the way their soldiers on the ground are talking with these moves inside Basra where the British are now almost completely in charge of Basra with the moves inside Baghdad that they've gotten past that first hurdle where everybody said everything was going wrong and not to the way they expected it. So on the military side, I think they're going to uh, have a, a fair degree of uh, a meeting of the minds and comfort level. But when it comes to the political side, uh, that's a completely different story. And I think there really are some big issues between Bush and Blair that they're going to have to hash out. Uh, and how do we hash them out then? We heard Kofi Annan just about 90 minutes ago talking about 
what he believes truly is a significant role for the UN to play uh, in Iraq. But then you have this counterbalance here about the, the difficulties going through the Security Council prior to the beginning of this war. How is all of that meshed together, uh, or is it successfully? Well, I think it can be done, but it's going to require magnanimity on the part of the U.S. administration, and it's going to require some flexibility on the part of the French and Germans and Russians who oppose this war, and uh, those qualities have been sadly lacking to date. But if they were to uh, try to come together, there is a way to do this, and the way to do this is to have the period in which Jay Garner, the retired American general, is running the country be as short as possible and find a way, perhaps with the involvement of the Secretary General of the United Nations, to get a group of Iraqis both inside and outside Iraq to come together in some interim authority, some interim Iraqi government that would then be legitimized by the United Nations Security Council, not as a permanent government, not as the final government. Uh, that would come much later after some elections or some other processes to choose the uh, a Iraqi government similar to what we did in Afghanistan. But if the United States insists on running the country for many, many months before transitioning to some Iraqi group that would then be able to be endorsed by the UN, that's going to be a big problem. Because what is not understood well in, in America, I don't think, is that unlike the war, where the United States and the British, if they didn't like what was happening on the second resolution, could just throw their hands up and say, we tried, and then go to war. In the case of uh, the post-war period, this time the British, uh, the, uh, the Germans, the French, the Russians, they have leverage. They have uh, an, a need to endorse the lifting of economic sanctions on Iraq and the allowance of international reconstruction to go in and take control of the assets there. That can't be done without the acqui acquiescence of, of the opponents of this war. So both sides have to uh, find a way to work together. Jamie, i got to get back to our InBez, but quickly here you mentioned uh, a short time, a short period of time before it's handed back to the Iraqis. How do we define that? Paul Wolfowitz said yesterday perhaps six months. Um, in your estimation, what is a safe amount of time uh, before the Iraqis really start getting ticked off and saying, we want our country back? Well, I think what Wolfowitz was talking about was six months until you get to the legitimate uh, Iraqi government, the government that's selected by the Iraqi people. I don't think he ruled out some period like six weeks where the Americans would take over, run the industries, run the ministries, run the oil production, get things started, allow the UN to, uh, to deliver aid, and during those six weeks, you'd have to select a group of Iraqis that would then be endorsed after that six-week period by the Security Council. That's the way to unlock the, the puzzle. Okay. Got it. Jamie, thanks. Jamie Rubin in London will talk again, I am certain. Earlier today, uh, just a few minutes ago, I mentioned this bridge near Basra. I misspoke completely. I meant Baghdad, southeast of Baghdad. We do believe this is over a canal uh, that feeds into the Tigris River. Marty Savage, embedded with the Marines, is providing us uh, this image here, along with his photographer, Scott McWinney, by way of video phone. We are told Perhaps within three minutes, the Marines might be ready to detonate this bridge. Damage, we're told, uh, as a result of fighting over the past 24 hours. Before we get back to Marty by telephone, Lisa Rose Weaver is situated just outside of Baghdad, I believe. Lisa, what's happening there? Well, yes, uh, uh, Bill, I am uh, just at the perimeter of the uh, International Airport. In the distance to my northeast, I can hear the 3rd Infantry uh, exchanging pretty heavy artillery there with uh, Iraqi forces at the front line. I don't, I'm not sure exactly how far away that is from me. Several kilometers, it's not anything that I can see, but I can certainly hear it. Meanwhile, we arrived here. I'm embedded with uh, a Patriot missile battery. It arrived here a few hours ago, and uh, some of the uh, forces here found some old bunkers that the Republican National Guard had apparently left in very much of a hurry. They found uh, quite a lot of unused ammunition, no evidence of chemical weapons, although there were gas masks thrown on the floor along with clothes and food, some old bread and potatoes, and, and strangely, baby formula, which uh, uh, one of the investigators here speculates the Republican National Guard may have been eating for, for nutrients, assuming that bread and potatoes was all else that they were eating. 
it, it happens to be fairly quiet now, but again, intermittent artillery exchange uh, between the 3rd ID and Iraqi forces off to my north. Bill? Lisa, thanks. Lisa Rose Weaver again bedded right near Baghdad. And back to Marty now. Marty, have those vehicles moved out? Are we ready for what we're awaiting now? Well, I believe we are, Bill. They have looked at actually using uh, dead cord and uh, what they call sort of uh, igniters. So it is not like somebody standing by with a button to push. This is uh, the boat that you may have seen earlier underneath the pylons there. What they did was they rode up there, the uh, demolition experts, and then they triggered the igniters, which is really just like, uh, well, a little more sophisticated than flint against steel. But we're told it uh, should be pretty close now, and they had a 10-minute fuse, and they measured out. So, uh, like I say, it's not down to the exact second of science. There are a lot of Marines that have gathered here for this event, probably not the most significant event in this war, but it is something they know is going to happen, and the Marines do like to see things go. They're always willing to look at the action, so we'll wait. Uh, Marty, as we await, I'm assuming this bridge is beyond repair. Am I right? Yeah, I would say. I would uh, say I'm right. The concussive <laughs> force just from this vantage point uh, was pretty strong. And now we're going to wait and see just to make sure nothing's going to come flying out of the blue onto our head. Uh, the smoke has uh, completely obliterated the the bridge site, and uh, the flash was so intense I, I'm having a hard time focusing my eyes. But we will give it a, a few seconds here to wait for the uh, for the smoke to clear. I got a cheer from the Marines; they obviously were impressed by that. Clearly, the uh, the demolition guys didn't hold back on any of their charges on this, judging by the uh, force of the explosion and the way we felt it here. Um, we're just looking to wait for the smoke to clear, but I think you could probably safely say, judging by that, it's been uh, mission accomplished. Now, the idea was not to bring down the whole bridge, just bring down that uh, center span, and uh, as the dust clears, I think you can start to see that they achieved just that, Bill. Wow. Marty, back up a little bit. Heavy, intense fighting over the past 24 hours that led to the uh, uh, the damage for that infrastructure, for that bridge. Hang on a second, Marty. I believe we've got the... Let's go back a second here for our viewers and roll it again without me talking this time and watch it. And so we'll wait. Yeah, I would... Right after that explosion, uh, you, uh, you, can, you can hear the Marines uh, give up that hollow. Uh, hey, Marty, take us back to real time right now. What happened 24 hours ago with the intense fighting around that bridge? Well, this bridge was uh, obviously it's a key crossing point. Any bridge across any waterway at this point, as close to Baghdad as we are, will be. And it was the job of the 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines that were spearheading the drive across. Now, first they had to get through this village here, and there was quite a firefight that was going on last night. RPGs, uh, AK-47 fire, and artillery that was being lobbed around the Marines. So they had to fight their way to this position on the banks of this particular canal. Then at daylight, they were poised to cross over on that bridge and there was an armored personnel carrier that we understand that was struck by artillery and that two marines were killed in that strike uh, we also understand that there may have been other casualties that were suffered as they fought their way through the village the village is now fully in the control of the u.s marines and there are armored personnel carriers and humvees and just a lot of plain uh i was going to say leathernecks that's the, uh, the slang jargon that the marines use to talk to themselves uh, now in the alleyway streetways of this town. As we drove in, it was interesting that after the heavy firefight, a lot of people waving, and I'm talking about Iraqi civilians, a lot of people cheering and uh, expressing what seemed to be uh, happiness over the fact that the, the Marines have liberated this particular spot. So it, it was an intense fight to get here, but now that the units have crossed, pushed over, we are told that they are not meeting significant resistance on the other side. So, yeah, Marty, listen, if you could, if you could have Scott go in, we're told that the, uh, the image is getting very dark as the evening grows longer there uh, in that part of Iraq. If he could maybe go in on that.
fan that's been detonated at this point. And as he does, Marty, I, I, maybe you give our viewers a better idea as to how the, the temporary construction of a bridge right near you, off to the right, uh, how long that took to get done, and also how long it may take for this group of Marines to cross that river now. Well, I was a little bit uh, drawn out by the sound of that earth mover as it went by, Bill, but the, uh, uh, if you can ask me that question again, I'll be able to hear it out. <laughs> All right, it's not an exact science, that's clear. If you could have Scott McWinney maybe go in on that span that's been blown away, we can see just how precise the, the detonation was. And while we do that, let our viewers know, again, uh, how long it took to set up that temporary bridge with a number of Humvees and uh, amphibious assault vehicles right now that are moving across that bridge. Okay, well, uh, you're looking at the segment that was destroyed. It's a bit uh, deceiving to you only because these are actually two spans side by side. And what they did was they took out uh, the portion of the heavily damaged span. There's another span that's still intact. Uh, that they're still going to make a determination whether that will be safe for civilian use or not. In time, it is not probably strong enough or secure enough for the military hardware. We're talking tanks and armor personnel carriers, so that's why the engineering unit created this uh, temporary bridge. It was up in a matter of hours, I suppose, uh, and they had units going across. So they, uh, as you mentioned before, they practice this a lot. They even have competitions when they're not doing wars to see how quickly they can assemble a bridge. And it's usually achieved fairly quickly. Uh, you have a lot of prefabricated parts, and it's a matter of setting them down, bolting them together, and they float on pontoons, and then the equipment rolls across. So they will now start pouring all of the marine assets across their bridge. We're watching, uh, you see the, well, I, I'm sure you can in this light now, but that bulldozer is actually starting to move across the other span. So I, I think we're going to get a pretty good test as to how strong the remaining structure is. But again, there were two bridges side by side. They brought down the one that the Iraqis had uh, partially destroyed in their retreat. Got it. Marty, thanks, and have a good night. Thanks for sharing that with us and to your crew and Scott McWinney as well. As Marty pointed out there, that bridge detonation, perhaps not the most exciting thing that's happening right now in Iraq. However, very fascinating to see how the U.S. military moves across the field of battle during a time of war, a critical time there for the Marines to keep moving uh, toward their destination, which is Baghdad. Let's get a break right here. The General is back, Wesley Clark from Little Rock right after this. Back in a moment. Yeah, I would say uh, the concussive force just from this vantage point uh, was pretty strong. And now we're going to wait and see just a